Hi, everyone. Welcome to Defending Democracy. My name is Leslie Bockel, and I'm co-executive director of NJ Eleventh for Change. You'll meet our other executive director, Mara Novak, later in this live stream. Uh, Defending Democracy is a panel discussion series brought to you by NJ Eleventh for Change, a grassroots organization in New Jersey's 11th Congressional District. Our goal is to foster an engaged, informed community with the power to shape our political representation so that it reflects the values of fairness, compassion, inclusivity, and a decent quality of life. We demand transparency, responsiveness, and accountability from our representatives, and we promote an ongoing dialogue with our elected and appointed officials. Tonight's Defending Democracy panel discussion will focus on transforming public safety, what the problems are today in our law enforcement system, and what a better re-envisioned system could look like. Leading this conversation will be Julie Burstein, a Peabody Award-winning radio producer, TED speaker, and best-selling author. Julie is the creator of WNYC's Studio 360 and has spent her working life in finding ways to share complicated, nuanced topics with audiences that are curious to learn and build their understanding. Now, speaking of curious audiences, our speakers have kindly agreed to take a few questions from listeners at the end of the panel. So please type your questions into the chat if you're watching live on Zoom or in the comments if you're watching live on Facebook. Let's take it away, Julie. First, I have to unmute myself. Hi, I'm Julie Bernstein. Thank you so much, Leslie. And thanks to everybody who has joined tonight. You know, I was thinking back to two years ago when we were doing these live in different venues around New Jersey 11. And I'm sorry that we can't gather in person, but I'm really glad that everybody is here electronically and that we can still have these important conversations. As Leslie said, we'll have time for a few questions at the end. And so if you are watching on Zoom, you can ask questions through chat. And if you're watching on Facebook, you can write them in the comments. So we have an enormous, crucial, and fraught subject to grapple with tonight. And that is how to address the deep inequities in policing in our country and what might be the ways that we can transform public safety in our own communities. We have an hour, so we're only gonna be able to explore a tiny fragment of the issues, but our hope is that this will open up a discussion that you can continue with your friends, with your family, and New Jersey 11 for Change has resources that they're going to share at the end of um, today's talk, and it'll be on the website so that you can learn more. Given a lot of the terrible events that keep occurring year after year, it can feel sometimes like there are no really effective paths towards change. But tonight, we're going to hear some stories about change and approaches that offer hope that we can do better in this arena. And I know we're also going to um, see at the very end something that the New Jersey Institute for Social Justice has put together 10 ways that we can do social justice together. Our guests tonight are two women who care deeply about these issues and approach them from different perspectives. Andrea McChristian is a lawyer who has devoted her career to social justice. She is the law and policy director at the New Jersey Institute for Social Justice where she oversees the programming for the Institute's three pillars of social justice, democracy and justice, economic justice, and criminal justice reform. Andrea is also the primary author of Bring Our Children Home, Ain't I a Child, which is at the heart of the 150 Years is Enough campaign, calling for transformative youth justice. Laura Merce has spent her career in law enforcement, working for local police departments and federal agencies. She's worked in a threat management unit, which provides special training on de-escalation techniques. And through her work with federal agencies, she's developed extensive experience in comprehensive community-based law enforcement within the military. So let's start our conversation. And Andrea, I'd love to begin with you. And you, you, the two of you can unmute yourselves. Thank you. Um, and, and I want to start with some of the heaviness that we are grappling with tonight. And that is the really terrible statistics in our own state 
regarding policing, particularly when it concerns young people. What kind of disparities do you see in terms of how young people are treated by the police and the judicial system right here in New Jersey? Sure, and thanks so much for that question, Julie. I think, and thank you so much, um, Aaron Leslie, for the invitation to be here today. I think what's so important is in looking at the policing issue, specifically for young people, it's often young people who are having the daily interactions with law enforcement, primarily within our urban centers, primarily our black and brown young people. Um, and what we're seeing is that within certain jurisdictions, kids are able to be kids and are treated with diversion, treatment, services, counseling, etc. While in other jurisdictions, they're diverted directly into the youth justice system. And so um, something I want to lift up that I know we spoke about before is that in New Jersey, every single law enforcement agency in the state per an attorney general directive is supposed to do station house adjustments, which means that if a, a police officer comes into uh, interaction with a young person who's committed a first time low level offense, the police officer will bring them to the station house literally, but offer them a series of diversionary options such as community service, such as speaking with a guidance counselor, um, such as uh, writing a letter of apology to the person they've harmed. And if they complete those conditions, a complaint isn't filed against them and it's like it never happened. When I did our first report in our youth justice series, um, Bring Our Children Home, Ain't I a Child, we found that the majority of law enforcement agencies in the state weren't using station house adjustments at all. And the ones who were, were primarily in suburban white homogenous communities. And so that right there is a clear example of how young people, one, are having these interactions more with law enforcement in our cities, but two, after those interactions aren't being diverted. And that's exact as much as their white counterparts. And that's exactly the basis of our 150 years is enough youth justice campaign, which is that over policing at the front end of black and brown young people has led New Jersey to having the worst black to white youth incarceration disparity rate in the country and the fourth highest Latino to white youth incarceration disparity rate in the country right here in New Jersey. So that policing front touch is critical to making sure that our young people, particularly our young people of color, are kept out of the youth justice system. When we hear these statistics, they're, they're just heartbreaking and horrifying. And I hear from what you're saying that the Attorney General has a ruling about these station house um, adjustments. Are there things that we can be doing in our communities or at a state level to encourage more equity in, in the application of these things? Sure, um, so we actually wrote another report um, on New Jersey's Youth Services Commission. So each county within New Jersey has what's called a Youth Services Commission that's responsible for identifying and funding youth programming from prevention, diversion, and intervention programs at the front end through reentry services when young people are coming back into the community. For the past, I believe 20 years, the amount that's been given to counties from the state has, has barely budged, where it's traditionally about $16 million spread out across all 21 counties to fund these programs while we're spending around 55 million on our state's three youth prisons. And so something that community members can do to get involved is that the Youth Services Commission's meetings are open to the public. Um, a policy recommendation we had is that most of them are happening during the weekday at like noon, which is difficult for parents and students to attend, but we encourage you to attend these meetings to get the documents The each Youth Services Commission has a three-year plan that lays out all of their programming, all of the racial disparities at each touch point of the system. And so read these documents, engage in these meetings, try and get positions on the Youth Services Commission so that you can affect um, a, a quality programming and services for young people in your county. And it's interesting, you know, the pandemic has made so many things much more difficult. But one thing I've found, at least in my own town, is that it's made participating in town meetings and planning meetings much easier. And so, Leslie, I hope maybe we'll be able to share links so that if people do want to get involved, there will be ways to be able to do that. Laura, I wanna to turn to you because in your work in the military, you work with young people who are probably 
either just a little bit older or just about the same age as the young people that Andrea has just talked about. Um, how does the military approach law enforcement and how is that different from what we see in civilian communities? So for the military, um, there's really, you know, the military has its own separate justice system. It's called the Uniform Code of Military Justice. And there's two competing um, sort of goals. One is good order and discipline, meaning that we have, you know, safe community, but the other is called military readiness. Is the military, is this unit ready to go off um, into, into battle or is the ship ready to, to go to sea? And so the commanding officer who acts, you know, as sort of an interim judge in a lot of cases has these competing goals. And as a result, instead of, uh, it, as we investigate a case, instead of just saying what happened, they'll oftentimes look at the why behind the crime. And if they look at the why behind the crime and if they can figure out why this person has committed this action, is there something we can do that keeps them in their job? You know, these are 18, 19, 20 year old kids. Is there something we can do to keep them in their job to help them get them the support they need so that way they won't do it again and we can keep our, our military at a state of readiness? And I think that that competing goal has a lot more compassion uh, than our current civilian military or our civilian justice system. Do you have a story you might be able to share with us of how that played out in perhaps a, a, a case that you were able to um, participate in? Um, yeah, so um, when I was, you know, maybe about 15 years ago when I was starting out in the, in the military system, uh, I came across an individual who reported that his home had been broken into on the base he had just cashed a check from his mom for about $1,000 for Christmas presents for the kids. Um, and that money was stolen. And so he needed a police report from, you know, from my office, as well as um, you know, he, he, he needed to file an insurance claim for the missing money. And through the investigation, uh, we were able to show that there was no check from his mother. He was lying about it. He was in financial difficulty. Uh, and so if you look at that from just a, a law enforcement perspective, from just with the eye of, of a police investigator, you say, well, he committed wire fraud, he, you know, he committed false official statements. Uh, so these are the federal violations. But when we look at the why behind it, and when we went to the commanding officer and they said, well, this family will not be served by this person going, being tossed in the brig and thrown out of the military that will not help anyone. Instead, can we keep him in his job? Can we provide assistance? And we were able to do that. The military, believe it or not, is actually fairly progressive in the assistance that they give to, to families. And so uh, that he got financial planning, free of charge, financial classes on how to budget. He got uh, that we signed the family up for uh, the women, infant, children program so they could buy family supplies. Um, and so by getting them into these diversionary programs, he doesn't have a criminal conviction on his record. He kept his job. And while I can't say what happened, uh, you know, up to the present day, I can say that I maintained a very good relationship with this family. And when I left that military base uh, about four years after that investigation, they were at my going away party and they were doing very well. Uh, so there's a, a level of, I think, compassion that we don't oftentimes get in the civilian world uh, that is present in the military system and services too. Well, that's, you know, it's the services. One of the things that I hear both in this story and a little bit, Andrea, in, in what you were saying about how do we, how our dollars are spent in terms of support rather than incarceration is at the heart of, of what's been percolating in our national conversation recently, that um, the police are being asked to do many jobs that they are not trained for, and that others would do better addressing issues of mental health, of homelessness, social challenges. 
And this conversation often revolves around the phrase defund the police, which I know, Andrea, in my conversation with you um, and also my conversation with people at New Jersey 11 can, can evoke a visceral reaction in people. But Andrea, I'd love for you to talk a little bit about how we might approach this issue of police being asked to do things that they're not trained for and that other people could do better. Sure. So at the Institute, we kind of think of public safety in kind of two different pathways. So one is how do we how do we strengthen and improve traditional law enforcement? So how do we give police agencies uh, better training, stronger policies, greater accountability tools so that the traditional policing model can be improved? And with that, uh, our position is that community input and feedback should be at the heart of that. But additional pathway and kind of what you were describing, Julie, is outside of policing, how could we better resource communities with the support and services they need so that they can be better supported in public safety without having to reach out to law enforcement. And so that, to your point, um, speaks to um, funding mental health services, funding um, transitional housing options, funding drug treatment and services, funding schools, um, funding um, different streams and mechanisms, restorative justice programs, et cetera, so that the community is able to get the resources it needs to protect itself and stay safe. And so something that we're heartened to see, for example, in Newark is that they recently diverted um, a few million dollars from the Office of Department of Public Safety to an Office of Violence Prevention, which is going to provide a lot of needed social services in the community. And so I think when we hear the word defund, we hear abolish, people think, okay, tomorrow we're gonna wake up, policing isn't here. Some do hold that position, let me be clear, some do hold that position. But from our perspective, it's about how do we envision a world where one day police aren't necessary, but in the interim, how do we better resource our communities to make sure that every young person, every family member has access to a good school, has access to a strong restorative justice program, if they fall on hard times, has access to homelessness service, mental health services, drug treatment services, so that, for example, someone's walking down the street they see someone who may be having a mental um, health issue. Their first instance idea isn't to call the police who may escalate the situation quite candidly if there's not proper training and, and wherewithal versus calling, for example, like they have in Eugene, Oregon, they have something called the CAHOOTS program, which are mental health first responders who are trained mental health workers who can respond to a mental health incident. Why don't we have that in place? Why don't we have um, as mom Claire is doing restorative justice programs throughout the schools. Uh, there was a statewide, there is a statewide restorative justice in education pilot um, that's supposed to be moving forward, but in the last budget, that money was cut. And so we have to be careful about when we're talking about improving policing, giving police more, which, you know, has its place, but making sure that we're not depriving the community of needed resources that they need to keep themselves safe in the first instance as well. And one of the things, it's interesting because both Laura and my conversation with you and Andrea with you, this word community comes up. And one of the questions is, what is our community and what's the role of police within our communities? And Laura, I want to turn this to you because the military is a kind of closed community. What role is policing seen as within the military community? So within the military, uh, there's sort of two levels uh, of policing. You've got uh, your military police who are the officers who would be on patrol. Uh, and then you have, you know, my organization, which tends to be more of the detective, right? if you're going to compare that to a, a, a police force in the civilian world. Um, and the community is everyone. The community is everyone on that, on that military base, whether it's the family, whether it's the military members. Um, and so the role of the military police is really about keeping people safe, protecting people, making sure they get home all right. Um, so, and then for my job, it's to obviously investigate crimes that are reported to us. Uh, so those tend to be the more serious crimes. And again, to look at not just what happened, but oftentimes why it happened. Uh, 
Um, so, but it's a, it's a difference between, I think, warrior versus guardian. Um, you know, it's the military, you can have, you, you have warriors that they go off and they fight battles. But for police officers, it should be, the priority needs to be protecting people and making sure that everyone goes home safe at the end of the night, that everyone is okay. And I, mean, I think that that perspective sometimes gets lost in a lot of civilian police forces and a lot of patrol officers where the mentality changes to, um, I'm gonna make sure I go home safe tonight. Within the military, what, what is it that allows for this sense of community that, um, it, it sounds like from our conversations, the police feel like they are a part of the community that they're policing, that this is not, uh, they, they don't have any distance from the actual people that they are serving. Absolutely, yeah. It's, um, because everyone in there is a member, uh, every police officer on that base is a member of the military. So these are my brothers and sisters in arms. These are, this is my family. Um, and that sense of community that not only are the military police officers looking at you know, everyone else as their family, everyone else on that base is looking at those military police officers as family as well. And so there's a, a very, there's a tight bond that I think helps de-escalate a lot of situations that could be much more dangerous uh, if, if you're looking at someone as the other, as the enemy. In this case, it's, these are all my people. And again, I'm gonna make sure that everyone is safe, that everyone's okay. Andrea, you've used the word community also. And um, when you look at communities and policing, are there ways to foster that connection so that it really is part of one community? Or is that something that, that we still need to work a lot to address? Sure, and so I know within the Newark um, Police Department's consent decree process, so a consent decree is a court-enforced agreement uh, between two parties. The two parties here are the Department of Justice and the City of Newark entered into a consent decree um, in lieu of them filing a lawsuit um, saying that the Newark Police Division over a time of at least five years would undergo a series of reforms because they had had a history of unconstitutional practices. So Newark is under a federal consent decree. We're about to enter into year four. And some of the reforms that are included within that process include the creation of community service officers so that Newark is broken into five different wards. Each ward has two community service officers whose only role is a liaise with the community. So they're out there having meetings every day, walking the streets, holding neighborhood watch sessions, et cetera, to make sure the community members have that interface. Um, and so there are processes like that. They have to hold um, town halls, meetings, collect feedback, so community members are involved within that as well. I think kind of outside of that, there's additional tools to bring community and law enforcement together as well. Um, something that Newark had created was a civilian complaint review board so that appointed community members would hold, uh, serve as another accountability tool um, to make sure that law enforcement was doing what they needed to do. Um, that review board has essentially been litigation since it was first created. Um, it went up to the New Jersey Supreme Court. We're waiting on a decision any day now um, because the issue was that the review board was given subpoena power um, which the police union said overstepped their authority. And so we're waiting anxiously to see how that resolves. But another thing that the Institute has been very supportive of is five-year residency requirements um, for law enforcement to make sure that if we aren't having police officers and law enforcement who are from the community themselves, like born and raised police in the, community, the street that I grew up on, which you know obviously is ideal, at the very least, having them live in the areas they police for um, a minimum of five years, we think is essential to the, the point that Laura was talking about, not being the other, but being of the community itself. And so we know that that's something uh, Mayor Baraka and Newark has supported as well. And that legislation is currently in the legislature. Um, we're hoping that that advances and passes as well. I know when we spoke um, yesterday in preparation for this, one of the things I asked was, 
where can those of us who are concerned about this issue look for ways for, for ways that our own communities can do better. And you said that this consent decree, which I was able to find on the web, is a good place to begin that investigation. So tell me about the other things in that consent decree that you think have, have helped to change policing in Newark. Sure, and so consent decrees are really the most progressive way within to reform traditional policing. And so within the newer consent decree, there's the, the development of 16 policies that either were very outdated or have been created for the first time. So those include use of force policies, policies around stop, search and arrest, internal affairs, property, community policing, bias-free policing, First Amendment, LGBTQIA interactions, um, and body-worn cameras, um, and a number of others um, that will guide the police officers in their everyday interactions. Out of that, there is training, obviously, to um, the policies as well. Um, the Institute, as part of the monitoring team, was involved with reviewing those trainings, as well as community members. There were community member uh, key stakeholder meetings. There were town hall sessions where community members got to review the policies and provide input. And so now the exciting thing is we're about to enter into the auditing phase of the consent decree process, where we see, OK, you have the policies. We trained you to the policies. Is there actually a culture change going on that's both quantitative and qualitative? So we're very excited about that. Um, one of the uh, audits for the buy one cameras has already proceeded um, and has shown that, you know, they're very close to kind of hitting everything that they need to be doing at the auditing phase. There was um, not substantial compliance quite yet with notifying people that the body worn cameras were on um, and activating them. And so we're excited to continue the auditing process to see to your point, Julie, if there really is that culture change and sea change uh, through the consent decree process. One of the things that I know a lot of people were participating in and watching on the news was all of the, all of the um, ways that communities rose up after George Floyd's murder. And in Newark, the response, perhaps because of this First Amendment um, piece of the consent decree, was something that um, other people in other parts of the country looked at and said, look, Newark actually handled this well. Was that something that you felt also looking at it through the lens of the Institute? Yeah, I mean, I think that we, are very heartened by the protests and the response that we saw within Newark. We know that um, Public Safety Director Ambrose said himself that de-escalation training that was taught was critical to what we saw and de-escalation training is part of the consent decree process. In addition, um, there were many community groups out there like the Newark Community Street Team, which is a non-police first responder team that worked closely with the city and the police department to make sure that, you know, it was a very peaceful, peaceful protest. And so we think this is a great indication. Um, obviously it was a one time, you know, it was a one uh, event and we want to see through the auditing phase um, if there's kind of a culture change that can continue on, but it was very heartening um, to both see community members and police bought into to the culture change. As um, I prepared for this, I spoke with Mara and Leslie and Mara remembered an image that came vividly to mind to me also, which was the 2018 Women's March in Morristown which was extraordinarily peaceful. I, Leslie found an article that said there was only one incident and that was a woman having a, an asthma, some sort of respiratory attack. But as we marched, we saw tanks that were part of the police um, on the sides of the protest. Um, this militarization of the police has been going on for quite a while. What message does it send to us when we walk peacefully and see tanks on either side of us at a march for women's rights? Sure. Either of you. This, <laughs> so is, this is a question. I know, yeah, I can ask either of you. I think um, for, for us, um, a big push within our idea of community-based alternatives to policing where people say, um, well, how are you going to fund these programs and services? 
one thing that we want to point to is demilitarize, where there's this federal program, the 1033 program, um, that basically gives law enforcement agencies free military grade equipment. Um, and while it's free, obviously it costs money to maintain <laughs> this equipment that police departments, one, could be using to better liaise with the community through resources. Um, and just because it's free doesn't mean it's something you should take. I mean, that's something yeah. I often told my kids. Just because they're giving it to you doesn't mean <laughs> it's something that you should have. So this yeah. is, it is very disturbing to me. Anyway. And in our, um, in our 10 ways to do racial justice advocacy after you say Black Lives Matter document, we actually have um, a point, an action on for people to look at their counties. Um, levels of military grade equipment. We have a link to a military map that shows by county how much military grade equipment each law enforcement agency has. So I just pulled some. Um, in Essex County alone in 2018, we acquired $69,658 of military grade equipment. In Monmouth County, acquired over a million dollars in military grade equipment and over four million in Bergen. And so just understanding there, we're getting millions upon millions of dollars of military grade equipment that both will cost money to maintain and will escalate police civilian relations. So there's really no benefit um, to doing this, especially if we're at a time, a crucial time to um, strengthen and improve community police relations. Yeah, and to, just to add on to that a little bit, it, it also, it makes things less safe for, for the community. It also makes things less safe for police officers too, because when you have an escalation in tensions uh, between po uh, your police department and your local community, you have people who are less willing to work with you, who look at you with suspicion, who are more likely to potentially escalate into a violent situation. And that's the exact opposite of what we want. Um, you know, again, the, the idea being if we de-escalate and demilitarize, although some people may find this to be, um, to be confusing, it will actually make everyone a lot safer. Um, and it also takes away that othering, that feeling of there's an occupying force. Because when you feel like there's an occupying force, there's a natural reaction to fight that occupying force. And that's exactly what we don't want. And it puts police officers in danger. It puts the community in danger. Um, and it, it fosters distrust. And, and that within, is the exact opposite of what I think we all want. Within the military, do police have riot gear? And would they be showing up in tanks? Is this something that, that civilian police are sort of watching and saying, all right, let's follow what they do within the military? <laughs> uh, within the military, I have to tell you that the military police, our, our patrol officers in the military are probably the least militarized of any police force in the United States. Uh, they have you know, a, a sidearm, they have regular cars, they have the same military uniform that everyone's wearing on base. There, there's nothing really extra unless you, you want to count like a, potentially of the regular bulletproof vests they'd be wearing. But, uh, you know, in terms of the riot gear that I have seen in, you know, within a, the civilian police forces, no, I've never seen anything like that on any of the bases. And I've been on forward deployed bases. Uh, it, so it's, it's always shocking to me to see a local police department with all this kind of gear that I associate with the military folks who are actually going to fight a battle as opposed to going to keep my community safe. We're going to be able to go to questions in a couple of minutes and so if people have them you can share them via um, text, via chat, or um, via the comments on Facebook. Um, Andrea, I wanted to ask you, and Pat, you can bring up the, um, the image. Can you tell us about the New Jersey Institute for Social Justice's 10 ways to do racial justice advocacy after you say Black Lives Matter? What are the things that we can be doing right now to be able to make change within our communities? 
Sure. So the impetus for this really was people reaching out to us like wildfire, at, you know, in the moments of the protests when they were first happening, say exactly that question, what can we do in our community to help? And so we put together this 10 ways document really to give people action items that they can take back to their communities, their neighborhoods and start to get involved. And so the very first section is around policing and it includes um, making sure that you're aware of what's going on within the Newark consent decree process and seeing how you can use the policies and trainings that are happening there to strengthen your own law enforcement agency. It's talking about the militarization effort we were talking about before we can click on that map and see how much your county is spending, how much your county is acquiring military grade equipment and go back to your city council and say, we don't, we don't want this anymore. And also there's a bill in the legislature right now um, let me see if I have the number here. Well, I don't have the number offhand, but there's a bill. Oh, yes, I do. A4284 and S2617 uh, that are chokehold bans. So we know after the George Floyd incident where his neck was knelt on for almost nine minutes that across the nation, uh, several jurisdictions were calling for a ban on chokeholds. We think this is a easy uh, easy win um it shouldn't be a difficult or contested issue that chokehold bans are inappropriate to be used by law oh andrea i think we may have lost you for a moment if you can hear me um, I think we've lost Andrea. Oh dear. I need to um, turn on the overhead light and turn on the outside light. So um, your Andrea was going through this and Pat, why don't we just show the next two pages while we're trying to get Andrea back? Um, because I think that this document is really helpful. Why don't we go to the next page? Um, I found this document incredibly helpful myself, and I know it's going to be on the New Jersey 11 for Change website. Um, and it's on the New Jersey Institute for Social Justice website right now. But as Andrea said, you know, so many of us are wondering what can we do? And it is such a complex web of questions, but this really lays out many of the ways that all of us can raise our voices and begin to try to move towards positive change in this area. So I would really encourage people to go and take a look at this. Um, and if you have more questions, start asking them, asking them of your own um, local governments and of our county and state government too. Um, Mara, while we're waiting, to get Andrea back. Oh, I'm back. Sorry oh, about back. that. I don't know what, don't know okay. what happened. <laughs> <laughs> Zoom <laughs> happens. <laughs> That's what happens. So, so glad you're here. All yeah, right. I well, think, Julie, I heard you summing it up. It just really is a powerful tool um, that we're happy for people to use, to share, um, to really move forward um, a number of bills, but policy issues that are happening right here in New Jersey right now. Thank you for putting this together, Andrea. I mean, this you and your team have done an extraordinary job um, of, of helping us focus because I, I heard in what you said that just people were calling you because after what happened to George Floyd, I think we all were thinking, what do we do now? What do we do now? And you've helped us begin to think about how to do that. Um, oh, it looks like Andrea's video has... has frozen again. Andrea, what I'm, oh, are you back? What I might suggest, if everybody doesn't mind, is Andrea, if you want, join just with audio and we'll see if that um, makes it easier for you to remain part of the conversation because you're essential part of this conversation. Um, but while we're waiting, Mara, the, now I think is a good time to turn to questions. Are there any questions directed for Laura that you might be able, Mara and Leslie, um, is there? There are there are some questions. I want to start off just by thanking our tech guru, Pat Simon, who is behind the scenes making this all possible, um, without whom we could not do this. So just to say that. 
Um, we do have a couple of questions, um, and I don't know if, if, we, if I would say they're directed necessarily at Laura or at Andrea, but just to start off with, the first question, and it's a pretty core one, is um, should we stop using the phrase defund police, like that the words we use have power? And I think that kind of, I know a lot of people are asking that question. I'm not sure who would like to take that first, but I would like to hear an answer. I mean, I'm in law enforcement and I'm happy to say defund the police. I am not afraid of that, uh, of that phrase in the slightest. Um, and I think that it's important for us to recognize that the phrase defund the police had, was not a spur of the moment decision by, by activists who came up with it just sort of on the fly. These are people who have been, like Black Lives Matter has been fighting this fight for a long time. Uh, you know, the, uh, all, of, all of these the groups in the communities who've been doing this, trying to get the consent decrees, um, you know, for Newark, they've been at this much longer than most of us have. And so the, I think the important thing is for us to, when, when we come across people who are afraid of that phrase, is to exp you know, let them know what it means and to correct it. Because the moment we start talking about the fact that, oh, well, this might be a bad message, the argument becomes about the wording and not about the actions that we need to do. And so I think it's really important for us to focus on, on uplifting the message that Black Lives Matter has very carefully and very thoughtfully created. Um, and when we come across those who are skeptical, we can, we can have that conversation. Um, but you know, as as you know, just, this is my personal opinion. But uh, you know, as a member of, uh, of law enforcement, personally, I'm not afraid of that phrase because we are oftentimes asked to do things that we are not trained for. I, I am not trained in in mental health. I am not trained, um, you know, to to deal with with homelessness. And so, if we take some of those missions away from the police and the associated funding with those missions, yes, we are defunding the police somewhat, but we are, we're going to take that funding and we're going to put it into a different community safety organization. So uh, to me, I think that defund the police, the words do have power, and I think that it's intended to have power. Uh, and so I look at my job as as someone who has worked in law enforcement for 17 years, um, I believe in the mission to defund the police, and I think it will be better for everyone, including police officers. Andrea, did we get you back by phone? Yes, I'm here. I'm so sorry about that. Oh, that's okay. That's what I happened. I have no idea what's happening. <laughs> I've actually moderated things where I've disappeared. So I, this is just what happens over Zoom. So it's, yeah, it's just a part of the whole process. Um, but I'm so glad to have you, but I'm really glad your voice is here. Um, so Mara and Leslie, what other questions do we have um, from the audience? So we have a couple of interesting questions. One is, um, there's a question, speaking of community and transparency, can Laura and Andrea talk about the policies of police monitoring and surveillance of social media, particularly as it impacts our young residents, um, especially when they're protesting and participating in activities that are critical of policing policies. Um, for instance, there was recently um, some charges that were raised against some young Nutley Township protesters at a Black Lives Matter rally. So sure, I'd be able, I'd be happy to handle that because I know that there's a lot in the news going on about that right now. I think what's really important in the first instance is for young people to know their rights. Um, I know that one of our partners, New Jersey ACLU, has done a really good job of putting together documents about knowing your rights, which is which is wonderful. But I think on top of that too, being familiar with your local law enforcement's policies, if they have any around First Amendment, which will show um, in the instance of where I'm videotaping an officer, if I'm having some other kind of interaction with the officer, what are my rights about filming, about recording, et cetera. And something that's really exciting and that I encourage everyone to look at is that through the Newark Police Department consent decree process, they've created a really groundbreaking First Amendment policy that 
uh, we, we hope can be replicated across the state and other law enforcement agencies that both apprise um, civilians about their rights when interacting with law enforcement officers around those issues, but also outlines what police officers can and cannot do in those interactions as well. So I really encourage everyone to look at that policy, see if your local law enforcement agency has such a policy and advocate for the creation of one, if not. And I think you pointed to something, Andrea, which is so important, which is we need to educate ourselves. We need to mm -hmm. learn our rights. And that is to be able to have places where we can learn that is so important. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Um, I have another interesting question. Um, one is pretty specific. How can surrounding communities the surrounding communities of Newark and the Oranges, for example, support the goals of those communities. There's a lot of affluent communities. I live in one of them. How can we support their, how can we, how can we in NJ11 support their um, public schools, their uh, community systems? Is there something specific that you can point to? Sure, so, so I mean, I guess to, to go again, I would say, if you have a service or a program that is working within your community that you think could be a benefit to other communities, just reach out to community agencies, to schools within those communities, through service providers, and say, hey, I'd be willing to just even speak with you about how we got this up and running. If you have the funding available to help resource such a service, I think that's really important as well. I think in addition, those County Youth Services Commissions I mentioned before are, are critical, where if within your county you're seeing great programs and services, one, you want to be able to replicate those in other counties, so using that as a resource to spread information. I think the biggest thing is just you don't know what you don't know, and so if one uh, city or town is doing something great, it might not necessarily carry over um, to the other area, and so just reaching out to schools, program service providers, um, after school programs, et cetera, within your neighboring um, towns, et cetera. If you, see, if you see gaps, if you see ways that you think you can help, if you think a pilot program you've done was particularly helpful and want to be used as a technical support if they want to create themselves, just kind of reaching out in that way um, and sharing resources is an important first step. Mm -hmm. yeah, a lot of the affluent communities have, um, have very good resources and very good programs that aren't necessarily available elsewhere. And so I, one, I don't know that those communities realize those programs exist. Um, so I think it's, it's important to raise awareness that there are those programs and then, you know, help start them up if you can. That's a really good point. Um, Andrea, since we have you back, um, Laura gave a really great and detailed answer to the question of, um, what does it mean? Should we, you know, what do we use? What do we think about using the phrase defund the police? And Laura addressed that. And I was wondering if you wanted to also address that, that question of should we be using that because words have power? Sure. I mean, like I said before, some people, um, some advocates do literally mean defund the police. <laughs> take, take kind of away all the money from the police, put it all into social services. We don't need police. And so I think when people say defund the police, there are um, iterations of it where people literally mean we don't need police and other people um, mean why don't we look to what community-based resources um, need to be better resourced and fund those. So it's more of a transition of funding away from traditional law enforcement, more towards community-based resources and services. So I think the, the wording depends on kind of where you are in that position. If you literally mean it, if you don't, but I think has kind of a second consequence of that, no matter how you use it or say it, you just have to be able to explain afterwards because the question will inevitably come, what do you mean, where do you stand? And so I wouldn't ever, you know, say don't say defund the police, don't say abolish the police if that's something you feel strongly in which some advocates do. Um, but I would say just be prepared to, to answer if you mean transitioning money, uh, following money more into community-based resources, what have you. That makes sense. Um, I'm just looking to see what other questions we have out there. Um, let's see. Um, so one more question is, outside the military, are there existing 
towns or cities that have defunded the police and how did that work? Like what are the other models that are out there for community-based resources? Sure, I mean- For example, I don't know. There, there are a lot, of, a lot of people have talked about Camden, but I know that's a very complicated example, but just in general, what does it look like and where can we point people to? Sure, so I think from the, from the Institute's position, our focus is on community-based alternatives to policing. And so our position is what resources outside of traditional law enforcement have been working. And so, as I mentioned before, um, there's that CAHOOTS program out of Eugene, Oregon, which has um, been going on for several years now, which has mental health first responders to mental health concerns. Right here in Newark, um, where I'm based, where the Institute is based, we have uh, the Newark Youth Court which is a diversionary option where young people through um, Newark Community Solutions have a court where they are judged, they are lawyers, and they bring in young people who have been um, subject to a station house adjustment and rule on what the condition is that they're going to fulfill, such as going to a guidance counselor, such as letter writing, et cetera, so that they won't have a complaint filed against them. And that is a community-based alternative to traditional law enforcement. So I think even just thinking of outside of literally just pulling money from a police department and funneling it in a direct line, looking to those restorative justice programs, um, looking to those mental health first responders, looking to those uh, beefed up resources um, in social services that are outside traditional law enforcement is really the, the kind of lens that at least the Institute looks at this issue through. Yeah, I can say that in the wake of George Floyd's murder, there have certainly been a number of uh, city councils that have voted to, in future budgets, take money away and fund social programs instead. We haven't seen the results of that yet because that you know, those have just happened. So it's going to be in future budgets. Um, so I think we will see more departments that have been you know, not completely decimated, but defunded somewhat, taking some of that money and shifting it over into social services um, as, as part of this movement. And you know, hopefully we'll have some good data on that, on those cities that have done so already. Uh, and that'll probably be coming out within the next year or two as those budgets go through. That's one of the things that's really struck me um, Andrea, about what is going on in Newark with the consent decree is that not only is there a focus on the programming itself, but it's mm -hmm. on evaluating. Mm -hmm. and t is that an essential piece of this too? I mean, Laura, you just pointed to it, which is we don't know what these things will do. How do we go about evaluating whether the efforts we begin to make are doing what we hope they will do. Sure. Well, within the consent decree process, that's going to be the, the auditing phase, which we're just beginning, which will have a number of different data points, both quantitative and qualitative, on each of those kind of issue areas I outlined before to see if MPD is in substantial compliance with making headway on those reforms. And so within the consent decree processes, there's like a formal auditing process. Within um, kind of these community-based alternatives to public safety, um, that, that's kind of more tracking, okay, if we're in a certain community, certain neighborhood, for example, how many of these young people who want to pick that, we're getting into trouble before we put this resource in. Once we start resourcing in that community, the schools, we create a restorative justice program, we create um, a mental health support, we create um, homelessness support, um, we give them, you know, after school programs, um, extra services that they need. After we put all that money into it and we put a date and time where we think, okay, by this date, we're going to have some effective um, rehabilitation for effective support, making sure our young people have everything they need to stay out of trouble. How, how has that changed? Are those same young people still getting in trouble? Why? And how can we modify? And so I think it's more in terms of these community-based solutions, looking at the community, seeing what the community needs are, where the gaps are, and at a point in time after we feel we've resourced effectively, how has that changed and, and what can we do better and how can it be replicated if something is working? So, um, so we have two more questions. And um, uh, the first one is, how are police unions responding to 
what's happening with the pressure on police forces to defund, to give up some of their money. Not, not well for, the, <laughs> uh, for a lot of it. Um, you know, a, pol a union is designed to protect their members. Um, that's, that is the goal of, of a union for the most part. And so they are fiercely protective of their members and the unions have, you know, have resisted every, you know, or a, a lot of the reforms that have been proposed and the, and the defunding that has been proposed. So um, it, it is going to be an uphill, an uphill battle. Um, but it's, it's one that's, that's worth fighting. And I think a part of it has to be, we need to make the argument that this will be better for police officers in the long run. Um, you know, part of that de-escalation, it's better for officers in the long run if you aren't facing as many dangerous situations. Um, and part of it is, it's better for the officer's mental health as well if every day you don't go into work thinking you're under siege, that you're about to go into battle. Um, and so, I think that if we make the argument that this will be better for police officers um, and it will give them both better community ties and a better work, um, you know, work experience, uh, hopefully we can get some more buy-in uh, from, from police officers and police unions themselves. Because I, I, I know that most officers do not go into law enforcement with the goal of locking up homeless people for being homeless. That is not why they entered law enforcement. And so, and it can be very draining when you do that night after night. So I think it would be better and they will see better outcomes and they'll be able to focus on what they would really prefer to focus on, which is keeping the community safe, as opposed to quota numbers of traffic tickets or you know, arrests. Um, and so that would be my argument and my plea to the law enforcement community is that this will be better for everyone, including you. You actually kind of answered my last question, which was how would defunding the police be good for the police? So I guess I would ask Andrea, sort of the extension question is how would defunding the police be good for the community, be good for everyone? Sure. So I think, again, with our perspective being kind of community-based alternatives to public safety, I think it can only strengthen um, the communities because law enforcement won't be asked to juggle everything under the sun. They'll only be kind of, community members will only need to reach out to them when there's a serious concern that would require law enforcement. For example, if there was a mental health episode, there would be mental health first responders. If there was a homelessness issue, a homeless shelter could be called. If there was a young person issue um, that was, you know, minor and didn't implicate public safety issues, then we could have a restorative justice program like a youth court. And so I think community-based alternatives that are well-funded um, would make sure that law enforcement was only doing what law enforcement is supposed to be doing, maintaining public safety when there's actual public safety concerns. You know, as, as I listen to all of this, and I just have been so grateful to both of you for your generosity and your work on all of these issues. I realize we began with this by looking at race, but race is really at the heart of this too, in that the, the issues with policing often stem from institutional racism. And I guess a last question is, what are the steps, and maybe you'll send us back to that wonderful handout that you have, but what are the steps that we can do to begin to address that within our own communities um, so that we don't continue to see the terrible headlines and people don't continue to be murdered by the police. Sure, I mean, I, I guess I can start it. So I think that that's a powerful question. I think obviously in addition to the 10 ways to do racial justice advocacy document that education, self-education is a really important um, first start for allyship. Um, at the Institute, we write a, a number of reports on a number of different issues. So I encourage anyone to visit our website, gain information on issues around 
restoring the right to vote to people with criminal convictions who are largely people of color around closing youth prisons, which largely, largely impacts young people of color. Um, and just to uplift one of our recent um, reports is called the Racing New Jersey's Red Lines, where it starts with the fact that New Jersey has one of the starkest racial wealth gaps in the country with the median net worth for a white family of around $352,000, the highest in the nation, compared to a black family having one of around 6,100. But we, go, we don't just leave it at the present day. We say, how did we get here? By looking all the way back to when the colony was first founded, when white landowners who brought um, slaves into the colony were given additional allotments of land through the GI Bill, which discriminated against black um, returning uh, soldiers through redlining and racially restrictive covenants, which were alive and well here in New Jersey for many years. And so learning that history, learning about how we got here and how we see the racial inequities that we see in the youth justice system, in our adult justice system, with our racial wealth gap, et cetera, will educate you to be the best advocates that you can be to do those 10 ways to do social justice advocacy. And so I really think education is the first step and then taking those action items we put together as kind of the second step to get involved is a really important um, way forward. Thank you so much, Andrea, for that. And Laura, thank you for all that you've contributed tonight. And Mara and Leslie, thank you for organizing this and bringing us all together to talk about this really important issue that affects all of us here in New Jersey. And I love where you led us to, Andrea, at the end, which is education, that that is really our work. And then finding the ways that we can urge change within our own communities, within the state, and then within our country. And I know I'm talking to a group of people who already know how to do that. And so I hope we've given you some things to think about. And um, thanks to everybody who's asked questions tonight, too. Um, I'm, I'm just so moved by everything that I've heard tonight and um, look forward to continuing this conversation in my own home. And I hope everybody will do that, too, in your homes and communities. And we'll have more conversations in this Defending Democracy series. We don't have them lined up yet, but we know that we're going to do one on healthcare, another thorny, challenging issue that we're all facing right now. And then, um, was the last one on voting? Was that the-, uh, the it's, it's certainly what we're talking about is voting. That's what right. we're talking about. So I, I hope- It feels that, also know, incredibly timely right, right now. Yes, indeed. And, and is part of what I see in um, these 10 ways to do racial justice, vote and be counted is one of those 10 <laughs> ways. So, um, so thank you everybody. This was really such a, such a powerful evening and um, Especially Andrea and Laura, thank you for your time and for the work that you do. Thank you so much. Thank you. It's, thank you. And the thing on in. Zoom is we can't clap, but I, I can applaud <laughs> for, for the two of you. So thank you very much. I guess we, we need a, something where we can raise our hands. Yeah. So um, <laughs> thanks to everybody for being part of this. Yeah. And especially, especially um, thanks again to Pat Simon for coordinating all of this and, and making it possible. Uh, Julie, Laura, Andrea, thanks for your time. Um, there are few issues that are that are this important for the future of our country. So I love seeing everyone come out to uh, to, to learn about it. Thanks to everyone who who came out to listen. Um, please, you can visit nj11forchange.org. Uh, slash reading list to learn more. Um, Andrea and Laura and Julie have, have helped us compile a list of interesting articles that, uh, that, that you may find very, very worthwhile. So thank you very much. And I uh, hope everyone has a great night. Thank you so much. Good night. Thank you. Thank you.